Let's make a plot of real GDP as a function of time. So this axis right over here is going to be real GDP. So it's an actual measure, not just nominal GDP. It's an actual measure of the goods and services produced by an economy or the productivity of an economy. And over here, let's have time. Now, in our little country or whatever economy we're studying here, let's assume that over time its population is growing. So let me write these things down. So population. Population is growing over time. The po and this is not an unrealistic assumption. This is true of most countries. Population is growing over time. And also, let's assume that productivity is improving. Productivity. Productivity. And productivity is just essentially how much can each individual person produce. Productivity. Productivity is going up. And productivity goes up due to technology, in fact, probably mainly technology. Technology, mainly technology, but there could be discoveries of resources, discovery of resources, or it could be new business processes. And people would even consider that maybe technology. So new, new processes. So on a per person basis, they're able to produce more and more over time. So because of these trends, and these are trends that do take place over long periods of time in many, many economies, you would expect the real productivity of that economy to increase. So if you were just to do the long-term trend just based on these two things, the population growing and productivity improving, over time, real GDP should have a trend something like that. And that is the long-term trend of most properly functioning economies. But when you look at it on the short term, it doesn't look like a nice, smooth trend line like this. When you study any major economy in the world, or really any economy, any normal economy, instead of just going this nice, smooth trend line, it tends to look something more like this. Real GDP, real GDP will be going really fast, maybe higher than the trend line, and then all of a sudden it will it will essentially recede, or it'll essentially shrink. And then it'll start growing again, maybe go above the trend line, then it'll recede, go below the trend line, then go above the trend line, and it'll just keep fluctuating. It'll keep fluctuating around a trend line like that. And this fluctuation around this trend line, this is called the business cycle. This right over here, and you could maybe call one cycle, you could say it's from one peak to one peak, or one trough to one trough, or whatever you want to call it. It's this idea that, that the economy isn't just a nice, steady, you know, steady as you go growth. You have periods of fast growth going above maybe the trend line, and then it recedes, then it expands, then it recedes. And so this is the business cycle. Business cycle. Cycle. And the term cycle is a little bit misleading. Whenever you do a, think of a cycle, and even the way I drew it, it kind of looks like a nice, well-defined pattern, and you know, every every the same amount of years you're going up and down. It kind of implies that it's predictable. But the reality is that the business cycle is very unpredictable. And economists more than anyone have trouble predicting the business cycle. So when you think of a cycle, it's not this well, you know, it's not this nice sinusoid pattern. It's something much, much more unpredictable. So it does fluctuate up and down above a trend, but it's hard to predict. Hard to predict. And in general, you don't have the same period of time between every peak and every trough. And that's why it is so hard to predict. And, we, and there, the, there are different terms for different phases of the business cycle. And I kind of used it just in describing what was happening. Over here, where the economy is growing, so the economy is growing from there to there, from there to there, we would call this phase of the business cycle, so I'll highlight that in green, we would call that expansion because the economy is literally expanding. There's more goods and services being produced in that economy. And then when, and we'll talk about the reasons why this is happening, and then all of a sudden when it starts to shrink, the economy starts to shrink, this right over here, or you could call it recedes, you know, if you think of it in kind of a tidal analogy, this right over here is called a recession. This right over here is a, so that purple part right over there is a recession. And if a recession is bad enough, it is sometimes categorized as a depression. And there's different categories for a depression. There's the famous joke, when your neighbor loses your, his job, it's a recession. When you lose your job, it is a depression. But the interesting thing is, is we see this pattern happening every, you know, whether it's every eight years, seven years, every 10 years. But we don't fully understand exactly why it's happening. And what we're going to try to attempt to do in the next few videos is look at models that do attempt to explain it. And 
that's actually the whole purpose why we're going to study aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Now with that said, I want you to view those models with a huge grain of salt because those are, I would argue, overly simplified economic models that don't take into consideration probably the most important factor in the economic cycle or any type of market cycle, and that is human emotions. Human human emotions. You might notice in most of our studies of economics so far, we haven't really talked a lot about human emotions or human's tendencies to extrapolate the recent past or human's greed or risk of fear and greed and all of these things that are very real things because in traditional economics they don't fit neatly into the models. And there are there are new fields in behavioral economics and behavioral finance that do try to take into account things like human emotions, but it's not going to make its way into the models that we're going to study in aggregate in aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And the reason why I say human emotions is because that you know just based on you know, I spent uh, well, I think it was what, six or seven years in, in markets while I was an analyst at an investment firm, it was very clear to me that what drove market cycles and economic cycles to a large degree was based on human emotions. That what you have happening over here is that the further the more the longer time and this is once again this isn't kind of what you would classically learn in your freshman economics class. I'm just going to say this before we start studying the classical ones because I think this does give a better sense of what's probably happening in an economic cycle. Right over here, when the expansion phase is starting, people are still skeptical. They've just been through this, this, you know, people were getting laid off over here, people were losing their jobs, people were having trouble paying the bills, companies were had, had very low profits or maybe no profits at all, bankruptcies were occurring. So even though the economy is starting to expand right over here, people are kind of skeptical. In the recent past, they remember all of this pain. So they don't want to go out there and start spending money. They don't want to go out there and start investing. But the further and further they go from that point, and so I'm just explain kind of the emotional aspect of the economic cycle, which I think is probably the most powerful one. The further and further they go away from, they say, hey, maybe this is for real. Maybe this is really happening. And their memories of that pain are more and more distant. Their memories of all the risk, the memories of all the layoffs and the bankruptcies become more and more distant. And then they become more and more confident and more and more eager to invest. And so they start investing and spending more and more. They start hiring. They, and, and because of all of that, they see fewer and fewer bankruptcies, fewer and fewer layoffs. Hiring is starting to occur. People get more and more and more optimistic. And so the economy keeps growing. And when you go to points right around here, it's been a long time since anyone really talked about major layoffs and bankruptcies and people, you know, uh, and, and foreclosures and all the rest. And so people over here are feeling super, super confident. And they're probably underplaying risk at this point. And they're investing money. They're spending money like there's no tomorrow because they think there'll always be good growth. They're essentially extrapolating the recent past. And so they think, and there's actually even been uh, studies that show that even economists, when you ask them at this point, what's the, the foreseeable future going to look like, they tend to extrapolate the recent past. So say the recent past, we were growing like that, so in the future, we will grow like that. But at this point, essentially, people are being too bullish. They're being too, too optimistic, and they're probably misallocating investment. And then as soon as things, as things don't grow as people expect, they start getting a little bit fearful. But they're still in denial at this point. They get a little bit more fearful. But here they say, oh my god, something is going on. They start panicking. Layoffs start happening. Economy recedes. And then we, get, we have the entire cycle again. And to kind of understand this emotional aspect of it, this is something I redrew. I redrew a, a, a graph that always gets, that always gets kind of a, a chain mailed around or sent around uh, during the, usually at, during every bubble when people start becoming skeptical of the growth in economy. And it traditionally refers to stock market cycles, but stock market cycles are closely linked to actual economic cycles. And I think these words really do capture the emotional sentiment of what's going on in either during the business cycle or during a stock market cycle. Is that right? When we're you know, in, the midst, in the middle of an expansion, people are feeling pretty optimistic. A little bit further into it, people are feeling excitement. They're saying, hey, maybe this is kind of a new type of thing. Maybe we're going to be able to grow forever. Then there's a thrill. There are people just the last few years, all they do is they remember making money. They say, well, I'm going to put all my money in the stock market. I'm going to start buying pets.com and whatever else. And then there's euphoria. There's like, wow, easy money. I don't have to work for a living. I can just keep flipping houses or buying stocks of pets.com or whatever else, day trading. And then all of a sudden, you have some signs that maybe there was some bad investment, that people's investments weren't turning out as good as they expected. People get a little anxious. But then as, as you still perceive this, they start denying it. They say, you know, some people say, is this, are we in a recession? 
something. No, 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 we're not in a recession. It's been so long since we're in a recession. Things are different this time. The internet changes everything. Housing never goes down. But then as it continues, as the recession really does continue, they start to get fearful. They start to say, wait, maybe this is something going on. Then desperate, then panic. And that's when people really, if you think of a stock market cycle, really start to, to sell. In the case of a regular business cycle, they start to maybe underspend, they start to really hoard things. Then capitulation, this is when they say, OK, things are just bad, they're never going to get any better, and then they become despondent. And eventually, you could really say emotionally, people start getting depressed because they say, wow, it's been so long since we felt all of these good emotions right over here. And as many good investors will tell you, this is the best time to invest, this is the worst time to invest. But then there's been so long, even though there's maybe a little bit of growth right over here, it's been so long since we experienced all of these emotions. People are depressed. But then as the growth continues, they start to feel hopeful, a little relieved. They say, hey, at least we're not getting worse and worse. And then you get back to optimism again. So keep this in mind, because in my mind, the emotions really are the main factor that are playing in either stock market cycles or economic cycles. But when we study it kind of classically in an economics class, we're going to take, a, take human emotions a, a a bit out of the picture, which is a little bit artificial because they might be the most important part of the picture.